Hello everyone, I'm, I'm Brian Haas. I come from the, the Broad Institute, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I've been doing bioinformatics uh, since they started calling it bioinformatics, I think. Um, late 90s. Um, mostly I do a lot of software development, bioinformatics tool development. Uh, my, my original training was actually in molecular biology and biochemistry. Uh, but I decided that I didn't like working with uh, radioactively labeled bases and pouring gels, and, and uh, it wasn't fun for me. Um, but I loved doing bioinformatics, you know, and, and programming was a lot of fun. So I just, I just really enjoyed doing that. So, um, so I put down the pipette in in uh, early 1999, and uh, and started typing on the laptop ever since. Um, started my career in bioinformatics at a place called the Institute for Genomic Research in Tiger, uh, which is down in Maryland. It's famous for having sequenced one of the, the first uh, bacterial genome uh, in the mid-90s. Uh, it eventually became the J. Craig Venter Institute in, I think, 2003, maybe. Uh, I left there in 2007, went to the Broad Institute, and I've been at the Broad Institute ever since. Um, so what's not on my CV? So I was supposed to tell you something that's not on my CV. Um, and one thing that comes to mind is that my my house basically looks like a, a gift shop on the inside. Um, so I get lots of opportunities to travel, and every time I travel somewhere, I always got to bring home a bunch of trinkets. Um, so, you know, you walk in my house, it's just like trinkets from all over the place, and hanging on the wall, on the shelves, you know, you name it. Uh, drives my wife nuts. Um, so anyway, that's what I do. I travel, I, I collect things that collect dust. Um, all right, so today I'm here to teach you about uh, fusions, fusions of the genome, fusions related to cancer, how we find fusions, um, why they're relevant, why we care, and um, this is the second year I'm teaching this module. Uh, before that, uh, Andrew uh, McPherson, who's uh, um, he's, uh, he's an expert in uh, fusions and cancer, he's, he's developed tools in this area. Um, and I basically took over from him a couple years ago to, to, to teach this. So some of the slides are actually his slides, and um, and you'll see uh, his initials in the bottom corner of the slide if I basically reused uh, his material. Um, and I incorporated my own material into this as well. So my contact information is there. All right, so learning objectives of the module. Let's see if I can just move this around a little bit real quick. Okay. Uh, so we want to explore the impact of gene fusions in cancer. Uh, when I learn about the, the types of evidence that we have for finding gene fusions, understand uh, what it's like to, uh, to use the different tools for finding fusions, identify the common sources of false positives, and uh, assess a gene fusion's potential function. So we'll start with the definition of a gene fusion. It's formed by a fusion between uh, two distinct uh, called wild type genes, just the, the normal versions of the genes. And this, in the, in this happens in cancer quite often. Um, it happens through somatic genome rearrangements. Okay, so you basically have um, you know, translocations that happen um, within chromosomes, uh, between chromosomes, uh, that basically put two genes together that aren't normally found together, right? Creating a new gene product. And uh, the, the best example of this is, is something that was discovered back in, I think it was 1960. Uh, it's called the Philadelphia chromosome, where you have a recombination or recombination, you have a translocation. It's actually a reciprocal translocation uh, between uh, chromosome nine and chromosome twenty-two, uh, generating this uh, this longer version of chromosome nine. All right, and then you have this this tiny little version here of um, an adjusted uh, you know, chromosome twenty-two, chromosome nine chimera, and this this little one here is is, is called the was, called, was named the Philadelphia chromosome. And basically, this, this uh, translocation puts these two genes, this BCR gene and this ABLE gene, um, basically, it connects, the, connects them together, right? Half of the of BCR gene is connected with the, um, half of the ABLE gene, creating this, this new gene product, uh, which is a fusion between the two genes. And you find this um, in about 95% of uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia um, samples. Okay, and it's really, it's considered the hallmark of of this, um, this disease, this cancer. That's the best, probably one of the best, it is the best known example of this. Um, there are many other fusions that you find in cancer, and um, some of them you find you know, quite often in certain cancer types, and they're considered to be the, the hallmarks of those cancer types. 
Uh, others you find at maybe smaller frequencies, but they're still highly relevant. In many cases, they're thought to be or known to be uh, drivers of that of the cancer phenotype. And in some cases, they can be treatable. So it's really important to identify them in, in patient samples because it's going to have an impact on on their treatment and also um, on their prognosis. So BCR able one is just the you know, production example again. Ninety five percent of cases, they just need to be treated. of cancer with. Um, another well-known fusion is, is Temporis 2 erg uh, which is a fusion found in about half of the yeah, So, yeah, you find fusions not only in, um, in leukemias and, and we call liquid tumors, all right, and basically, you know, tumors in your blood. Um, you also find them in some solid tumors as well, all right, so prostate cancer is probably the best example of a fusion where you find it in a solid tumor. Um, there's the EML4 ALK, another kinase fusion that you find in um, a small percentage of, um, of non-small cell lung uh, carcinoma cases. It's important to identify this one too because this is another example of a treatable one, right? Because you can treat it with kinase inhibitors. Uh, there's uh, this DNA JB1 fusion that you find in 100% of cases for this uh, type of, of liver cancer, fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma, the mouthful. Uh, but 100% of the cases, so this, this is another you know, hallmark fusion. Uh, and there, there are some other examples that I'll, I'll walk you through later. Um, another one in brain cancer, FGFR3, TAC3 is, is, is well known, 8%. So we'll see some examples of these. And there's uh, you know, basic evidence that gene fusions are, are playing an active role in tumorigenesis. Um, the evidence comes from uh, the fact that we find that they, they correlate with cancer phenotype, although we know correlation is not necessarily causation, but there's other evidence too. Uh, we know that we can treat, so if you have if you have like a kinase fusion, you can treat it with a, a kinase inhibitor, and that, that effectively treats the cancer. Um, there's other studies in mouse, where you take a fusion and you, you put it into the mouse, it can, uh, it can produce a tumor. Um, and you can also um, these silence fusion transcripts using techniques like microRNAs or short hairpin RNAs, shRNAs, um, to uh, to re reduce the, the the tumors. So how can fusions drive cancer? And you could basically say how can you know whatever drive cancer? It doesn't have to be fusions, sorry, it could just be you know, something. How can something drive cancer? There's really two two key mechanisms that that are involved. There might be others too, but the two primary ways. Or one is that you, you can somehow activate a tumor oncogene, right? Uh, and the other way is that you can deactivate a tumor suppressor. So those are the two main paths. Um, so how do fusions do this? Well, anyone know what that means? No? Nobody knows? No one's Googled it yet to find out what it means? All right. Um, it's, it means there is more than one way to do it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so if you're a, a Perl scripter from the, the late 90s, you would know what this means. If you weren't a Perl scripter from the late 90s, you, you probably would. So there aren't any Perl scripters from the late 90s in this room, is what I'm, I'm taking it as. Anyway, Tim Taddy is kind of like the, is the acronym that, that kind of goes with the, the Perl programming language. And Perl was, was the, the most popular uh, scripting language for bioinformatics when they started calling it bioinformatics. Um, now everyone's doing Python including myself, to a large degree. All right, so you learned something. If you learned anything during this workshop, you, you know, this is Tim Tauti. It's, it's, it's gold right there. Okay, uh, so I have, uh, I have a number of examples here of how fusions are involved, at least thought to be involved or experimentally demonstrated to um, you know, have a molecular mechanism that's, that's, that's driving cancer. Uh, so I'm gonna walk you through these. Um, some will spend more time on than others. And by the eighth one, you're probably really bored, so I'll try to get through the last couple uh, very quickly. Uh, so we'll start with the most famous one, right? The BCR ABLE1. And here you have, um, you have this ABLE1, which is a, it's a tyrosine kinase. And you have this, this BCR gene. And you can see these arrows here point to where uh, fusion breakpoints are, are commonly occurring when they find these fusions in, in patient samples. All right, so there's a few different places where you, you have the uh, actual fusion event. Um, and when you create this fusion, you're basically putting these exons here for the BCR gene, 
uh, together with um, the, the tail end here of this um, AB, ABL1 gene. And what's interesting about this is that this, this creates an in-frame in protein fusion. All right, so we actually get a fusion protein out of this. We get a new protein, that, or part of the protein is, is from the BCR gene, and the other part of the protein includes the tyrosine kinase domain. Okay. And when, when this fusion protein occurs, it's basically missing important uh, regulatory controls that would be at the end terminus of this ABL, of the ABL1 gene. So you end up with this, this, uh, this protein, this kinase protein, which is, is constitutively active. Okay. And what does it do? Well, it drives cellular proliferation. Okay. They don't all, you know, all the fusions don't all create fusion proteins, right? In some cases, um, you know, you're not, you're not creating a functional protein at all, right? Um, there's, there's lots of different ways to, to do this. And, and creating an active, you know, new protein product that has altered functionality, that's, that's just one way to do it. And we'll see if there's, there's other ways to do it. Again, you're doing two things, right? You're actually creating an aquagene or stimulating an aquagene, right? Or you're knocking out a tumor suppressor. All right, so this is going to fit in one of those categories. Which category is it going to be? Aquagene, right? We're stimulating an aquagene, basically. Okay. All right, so the other, the other really well-known one is this uh, Tempris 2 uh, ERG. Um, ERG, or you can have this, the, another option here is ETV1. Um, ERG and ETV1 are, are both... Um, transcription factors, and they're both from the same family, the, the ETS family of transcription factors. And um, when you find, in prostate cancer, when you find the, the TEPRS-2 fusion, uh, most of the time, it's going to be with the, the ERG gene, the ERG gene, okay? A small percentage of the time, it'll be something else. It'll be, it could be ETV1. Uh, but when you create this fusion, um, either of these fusions, we'll look at the, the TEPRS um, ETV1 first since it's on top. And you can see where the, the actual breakpoints are happening here, all right? Um, and the way this, this is drawn is you have uh, the coding region in the darker color, and you have the five prime untranslated region and the three prime untranslated regions, the UTRs um, in the lighter color, all right? So the pink here is the UTRs, the red is the, the coding region of Tempers II, uh, which is a serum protease. Um, and in ETV1, here you've got in dark green, you've got the coding region. And the light green or yellow, you've got the, uh, the untranslated regions. All right, so if you look at the fusion product here, you have a transcript. Um, what you can see here is that the, you're, not, you're not getting any of the coding region from Tempers 2. All right, you're just getting this first exon, which happens to be an untranslated exon. It's, it's part of the 5' prime UTR. All right? uh, but if you look at the ETV1, you're basically getting the second half of the coding region. All right, so you're missing the, the first part, the end terminus of the, of the ETV1 protein, but you're getting the whole uh, C terminus here and this, uh, this fusion product. Uh, so what you're doing is you're making this, this fusion transcript that basically encodes the second half of the transcription factor. All right, but the point here is really that um, you're not making necessarily a new protein, you're basically making like part of a protein the, the key is that it's now driven by a different promoter, all right? So by making this fusion event, you've effectively put the, the, the ETV1 DNA binding domain all right, under control of the Tempris 2 promoter. And this is a very active promoter, all right? Because this, this gene, this Tempris 2 gene, is uh, it's upregulated in prostate, all right? Uh, so it's basically you're overexpressing the, the second half of this, of this. The same thing happens here. If you look at the ERG, you're actually getting more of the ERG. You're actually almost getting the entire... Uh, ERG coding region here, uh, but you're still getting just the the, the five prime uh, exon Tempers two. So ultimately, the Tempers two promoter is driving overexpression of this uh, transcription factor, and that's that's really the, the key driving event in um, in prostate cancer for that fusion. Okay, so another one. Um, IGH, MYC. Uh, so MYC, uh, you find it's a transcription factor, and, and MYC is a, is a well-known oncogene. It's probably one of the best-known oncogenes. And um, uh, IGH is, uh, is a part of the immunoglobulin heavy chain. So you know, B cells produce antibodies. Um, and what happens here is that 
you end up with a fusion where uh, part of the IGH locus gets fused with um, the, the tail end of MYC. And it's another case where now you have, um, it's really not a fusion protein that you're interested in. Um, the, it's actually that the, the, the promoter for IGH is now driving a good portion of MYC. All right, and that's actually what's, what's driving now um, cellular proliferation. This one is really interesting. Uh, so here's one where you have, um, you have the MIB transcription factor, um, and you have this N NFib transcription factor. And if you look at the structure of, of the, uh, the MIB transcription factor, you see you get the whole coding region here. Uh, you have this three prime UTR, and this three prime UTR has uh, microRNA binding sites. Okay, and these, these micro, so microRNAs are actually involved in uh, post-transcriptional regulation of uh, the MIB transcription factor. Uh, with NFib, uh, I don't think it really matters what's happening here with, with NFib. Uh, but you can see when you create this fusion here, you're only getting this tiny little piece, like maybe the very, you know, very tip of the C-terminus here um, in this fusion protein. You're basically getting uh, most all of MIB's coding region, right? Uh, but the key here is that you're knocking out the three prime UTR, right? You're not not including any of the three prime UTR uh, from MIB that has those microRNA binding sites. So you end up with this fusion product, which is essentially uh, it's MIB, right? Without the the microRNA regulation. All right. So now you have you have uh, you know, loss of, of, of transcriptional control, and that's now going to be the driving event. There's some experimental evidence for this. I just wanted to show you. Um, here you have um, so this like wild type MIB, and if you treat it with microRNA oligos, try to shut it down, you'll see a decrease in expression. Uh, over here you get the fusion, and the fusion is just, um, it's not affected by um, introducing the microRNAs. Uh, so that's a little bit of evidence for that one. Uh, here's another one, it's a, it's a complex fusion. This is a fusion you find in colorectal cancer. And um, in this case, you have this, this NCOAT, AT, NCOA2, transcriptional coactivator, uh, which is thought to be a tumor suppressor. And although this is a really complex fusion, it actually involves uh, three different chromosomal regions here. So you see if there's, a, there's like orange, blue, and green uh, that all come together to create this new fusion structure. The fusion transcript actually only includes exons from the orange and the green. So the, the little blue section here Although it's part of the fusion gene, it's not really it's not contributing to the transcript, and uh, and it turns out that all you're really doing with this fusion transcript is um, this this fusion is basically just knocking out <coughs> NCoA2. And since NCoA2 is is considered to be a, a tumor suppressor, and yeah, we're knocking out a tumor suppressor, so that's that's again one of our key mechanisms for being able to uh, have fusions contribute to cancer. Uh, there's some evidence for this where you basically have a, a growth curve. And it shows you that if you um, if you overexpress the the normal NCoA2 gene, all right, not the fusion, but the uh, the normal one, uh, you get a reduction in uh, cell, the cell index. Okay, so if you overexpress it, then you're not growing as fast. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, I think there's just a couple more here. This this is where everyone gets really bored. And they're like, okay, when is this going to stop? And I've seen enough. Uh, but trust me, there's there's a couple here that are really interesting. Uh, so it's worth it's worth going through. Uh, I keep wanting to take some out, you know, because uh, it does seem like you spend so much time on this. But each one is is just really interesting in its its own way. So I haven't figured out which ones to remove yet. Okay, so this one this one's interesting because it involves um, uh, an epigenetic component. Okay, so here we have um, we have uh, Mib, uh, another well-known oncogene. We've seen it before. Uh, with this QKI RNA processing gene. And if you look at the genes, the, the normal genes in the genome, here you have the, um, the, the MIB transcription factor, and here you have the, uh, the QKI gene. If you look at the epigenetic signatures, epigenetic marks around these genes, what you see is that the, the QKI gene has got tons of this uh, H3K27 acetylation peak. All right, so this is an epigenetic mark that's consistent with being uh, being expressed, like very well expressed. Okay, uh, you might consider it an enhancer mark. Um, now, when you make this fusion, 
So you don't see it. You don't see any of this, this H, H3K27. It's a histone acetylation. You don't see that histone acetylation for, uh, for MIB. All right, but in this fusion gene, what happens is that um, you create this fusion. You're basically just taking the tail end of QKI, tacking it on to, to MIB. Um, you're going to inherit the H3K27 acetylation at the 3' prime end, right? Uh, but now you can see it's actually now it's showing up at the, at the beginning of the MIB transcription factor, too. All right, so some of that signal is actually now sort of propagated over, and um, so now this this um, this enhancer mark is now helping to drive expression of MIC. Okay, and there's actually there's a few different things that are happening here, so that's why this one's interesting. There's actually multiple mechanisms that are involved, and in, in, at least thought to be involved in uh, contributing uh, to, uh, to to cancer. Uh, so the first one here is just inheriting the the um, histone acetylation marks. All right. Um, but the other thing is that the, the, um, the fusion protein uh, can sort of drive its own transcription as well. Right? There's an auto-regulatory feedback loop um, where this basically comes back and um, activates the, the mid-promoter. Uh, so that's, that's the second way this happens. And then the third, uh, since we're basically knocking out the QKI RNA processing gene, and that turns out to be um, a tumor suppressor. Uh, by knocking that out, we're also contributing. So sort of like a triple whammy here as far as um, how it's driving the cancer. Uh, this one here, this EWS FLI1, is another signature fusion you find in Ewing's sarcoma. Um, and this is, uh, so this is an interesting case here. You have the EWS gene, uh, which is a, it's an RNA binding gene, and it's a transcriptional activator. So you have a transcriptional activation part here in the N-terminus. You have an RNA binding domain here in a, at the uh, the C terminus, and then you have the um, FLI1 uh, ETS family transcription factor, and we've seen ETS family transcription factors before, all right? Like Tempris erg, Tempris ETV1 this is another one that's as part of the same family. Um, and what happens here is when you create this fusion, you're basically removing the RNA binding domain uh, from uh, EWS, but you're attaching its transcriptional activation domain onto the DNA binding domain of a different transcription factor. Okay, and you can just picture this here. So now you get this transcription factor, FLI1, right? It binds to where it likes to bind in the genome, um, and now it's taking with it the transcriptional activation domain of this other protein. All right, so what's gonna happen? Well, now you can get transcriptional activation at all places in the genome where that transcription factor likes to bind um, that, that aren't normally activated by this transcriptional activator. Um, and of course, that's, uh, that has consequences. In this case, there's a kinase that happens to be upregulated due to this, and that's going to drive cellular proliferation. I'm pretty sure this is the last one. No guarantees, though. All right. Um, so this is another one that's important because uh, it's it's another one that's a it's a signature fusion. Uh, you find this in in synovial sarcoma. I actually have we have collaborators that, that focus on studying this cancer and actually see patients um, with this disease. It's, it's pretty bad. Uh, but every every patient sample has this specific fusion. All right, so this is another like it's a perfect uh, hallmark of uh, of this disease. And the reason why this one is interesting is is not because it's um, uh, knocking it. Well, it, it's it's just interesting because it involves several components. But the key reason why it's interesting is because it again involves uh, epigenetic marks. Okay, um, basically you have regions of the genome that are are tightly compact and the heterochromatin. All right, and they're not being expressed. Um, and now this fusion gene um, will, will recruit um, a chromatin remodeling structure into these regions, right? And it does chromatin remodeling, it basically opens up these, these compact regions of the genome, allows for transcription to occur. Now you start getting activation of genes being expressed that normally would be really tightly wound up and, and not expressed. Um, so you have this, this, these two genes, SS18 and SSX. SS18 is part of what's called the, the SWI SNF chromatin remodeling complex. Um, and you have this SSX, which is a transcription factor. And when you create this, uh, this is actually a functional fusion protein in this case. Um, you, you basically uh, create this SS18 SSX fusion protein. And you can see uh, now this, this complex, this SWI SNF complex, which has this subunit now uh, that, that is this fusion protein. This is now going to be recruited to where SSX binds in the genome. Okay, and when it does that, well, SWI SNF gets to work. It starts remodeling the chromatin in those areas. We start seeing transcription, and um, and bad things happen. So that's the I think that's the last example. Right. Okay, so um, 
lots of ways we can do this, right? Um, we can we can impact cellular proliferation at the protein level by messing around with the kinase uh, cascades, right? Signaling pathways. Uh, we can do this at the RNA level uh, by manipulating transcription factors, um, post-transcriptional regulation uh, by removing regulatory motifs, like we saw with the, removing the microRNA uh, binding sites, all right? Um, then there's also at the level of epigenetic marks, uh, the, the DNA chromatin remodeling. We can reposition enhancers, and we can um, and we can perform chromatin remodeling in areas that, that normally would be uh, tightly wound up in heterochromatin. Okay, so there's there's lots of ways this can happen, um, uh, and that's where this little guy comes in. All right, so there's more than one way to do it. Perfect. All right. Uh, so what are the genomic effects of fusions? Genomic effects of fusions. Um, no, this is more about the signatures. Okay, so we have we have different ways in which we can detect gene fusions. All right, we have different technologies. Uh, we have different molecules that we can look for. We can detect fusions at the level of the, the DNA sequence, looking at the genome. We can do it by looking for uh, chimeric transcripts. All right, because if there's a translocation that happens and it creates a fusion gene, if that fusion gene is expressed, then hopefully we can find it at the at the transcript level. Um, also, if, if it's I maybe mean, it's expressed, if, it, if it's the driving event, all right, if it's, it's a diffusion that is like responsible for for uh, the phenotype, then, um, then hopefully we'll find good evidence of expression for that um, and capture it at the transcript level. Uh, we might also see um, might be able to detect it sort of indirectly uh, by expression changes. We might see that there are certain genes that are expression outliers in certain cancers. And, um, and, and maybe that's a signature, that maybe there's a fusion event that repositioned a promoter element, and that's, that's really what's involved. Uh, so there are a few different ways in which you can try to, um, uh, to detect, detect the, the fusion events, or get hints that fusions might be involved. So one of the earliest ways to look for fusions is to look at the chromosomes themselves and see if you see any evidence of structural abnormalities. Uh, so you can do a karyotype, right? You can look at um, at chromosome banding patterns, uh, G bands, they would call them. Even though it's, I think it's AT rich regions that are actually lit up. Um, they're called uh, called G bands. Um, you do spectral karyotyping. So this is uh, like a, an easier way to do this kind of analysis, where you basically paint the chromosomes uh, with by by using probes that have certain fl uh, colored fluorophores attached to them. Um, and it just makes it, I think, a lot easier to be able to detect the fusion events. Now, like here, you can see there's a yellow and orange. You know, if I was looking at this, I mean, you have to be an expert to look at these karyotypes and see what's, what's happening here. Um, but I think anyone could look at this and say, okay, yeah, there's an orange thing attached to a yellow thing, and that looks different, right? Um, so I, I kind of like this. Uh, there's another one here where you have gray attached to the white. Um, so that just makes it a lot easier. Um, you might be looking for so these are these are cases that are not necessarily these are unbiased approaches. So you're looking for just like any kind of difference, uh, but you can have you can target you can home in on specific fusions that you're interested in. So if someone comes in and it looks like it might be a, a CML a case of chronic myelogenous leukemia, and you want to know, um, you know if you have the PCR able one fusion, you can do a targeted assay. You, know, right? you can you can use probes that are specifically designed to find you know those specific fusions. And again, you can light them up with fluorophores. You can look at, at the chromosomes under the um, with the, the colors attached. You can see that there's a yellow and a red, or, or actually green and red. Green and red make yellow, so um, that's the evidence for, for fusion. Uh, so this is this is fish fluorescence and C2 hybridization approach. It's targeted. It's low throughput, um, but it can be useful. Uh, another thing that was useful uh, early on, uh, especially with uh, with microarrays, is just to look for expression outliers. Uh, so there's an analysis called COPA, Cancer Outlier Profile Analysis. Essentially, what you're doing is you're looking at, at all gene expression um, for all genes, and you're comparing uh, genes from normal tissues or normal samples to uh, to cancer samples. And, and you ask the question: Are there are there certain genes that look like they're um, expression outliers? As compared to the normal samples, uh, and this this kind of study, these, I don't really care for these plots. I think it makes it harder to to, to figure out what's going on. Um, but you just you picture it like it's a, you have a normal distribution of expression uh, for normal, and you have you know, have the same sort of distribution for tumor, and you want to be able to compare them. Um, these distributions are are, are basically uh, ranked 
um, where you have patient samples. These are each individual patient samples along the x-axis. And for each patient sample, you're looking at um, how much does that gene expression deviate from the mean. Okay, so all the samples are centered here at the mean. So the mean is zero. Uh, some patient samples is a normal, normal prostate. Some patient samples have expression that's below normal. Some have it that's above normal. Um, but then if you look at the, um, the prostate cancer cases, uh, you'll see, okay, there's a lot of them that are below normal, some that are, that are above uh, normal, above the mean. Uh, but you see that there's a whole bunch here of samples um, that have ETV1 really highly expressed, right, compared to what you're seeing here, um, the top for, uh, for normal. And then if you look at um, lymph node metastasis, you'll see that even compared to the extent of, of normal here, you're getting a couple, a couple outliers here. But this is really the key, right? You're finding a lot of patient samples here that um, appear to be outliers. And the same thing, if you look at, at the ERG gene, ERG gene, you see uh, normal, right? You get tumor, and you got, you got a whole bunch of tumor samples here uh, that have expression that is, is a far outlier compared to what you're seeing here with, uh, with the normal samples. And with the metastasis, you're seeing lots of outliers too. Um, so there's something going on here, right? We can see it's an outlier. We don't know really why it's an outlier. Um, maybe it's because there's a fusion. It could be that there's a promoter that got fused on and that's driving the expression now. It could be something else too, right? You could have a somatic mutation um, in the promoter region and that's driving it. There's, I mean, there's lots of, I mean, biology is, is uh, you know, it's, it's uh, rich with different ways to do things, right? Um, one thing we could do is, 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 well, one thing that they did here was look at um, are these are these patterns mutually exclusive or not? All right? When you find ETV1 as an expression outlier, are you also seeing ERG as an expression outlier in that same sample? All right? Or are they in different samples? And so what they did was here was just plot the ETV1 for each patient. Each dot is basically a patient. And you have expression level of uh, ETV1, expression level of ERG. And, and you basically see that when you have ERG as an expression outlier, ETV1 is basically not an expression outlier, or right? vice versa. When you have ETV1 as an expression outlier, uh, you basically have you know a pretty uh, normal um, ERG expression. So something here is is is, uh, is driving this. Um, and using a technique called race um, is uh, an early approach where if you have if you have a, just any sequence for a gene, like in the middle of the gene, you can do RT-PCR and basically get the whole full-length product, right? You can sequence that and see what it looks like. Uh, so in this case, you could take ERG or take ETV1 and uh, run the race to get the full-length transcript and see what, it, what does it look like. And what do you find? You find a fusion transcript, all right? And this is actually how they, they identified uh, Tempris 2 as being a fusion partner with, um, with ERG or ET, ETV1. Uh, so that was pretty clever. Uh, other discovery platforms for doing this, um, you can use genome sequencing. This is going to be comprehensive, right, because you're looking at the, the whole genome. If there's any rearrangements there, hopefully you can detect it within uh, the, the genome sequencing data. Um, the, the main issue here, well, it's two issues. One is that it's kind of expensive to do whole genome sequencing. Even though the prices keep plummeting and getting lower and lower, um, it's still, compared to other approaches, it's relatively expensive. And also, it doesn't give you any functional information in regards to expression. Because uh, you could have lots of fusions, right? Can't tumors and patient samples, um, so looking at cell lines, uh, the, the genomes are very dynamic, and you'll find tons and tons of rearrangements in some of these samples. Not every rearrangement is, is contributing necessarily to cancer, right? It might be that you have one fusion driver, right? But then you got like a hundred other different events that happen that are just neutral or sort of silent, they don't really contribute to cancer um, in a big way. So how do, you, how do you differentiate between a fusion that you find that is actually contributing to cancer and all the other fusions that are, are maybe just there because there's rearrangements that just happen because of the chromosome dynamics? Um, so it's useful to have expression information or to hone in on things that might, fusions that might be actually important and, and contributing. Uh, here's an example here. We have um, circos plots. Everyone familiar with circos plots? You see these a lot of times in the literature, right? pretty common. Um, and it's basically just showing, uh, using DNA, DNA sequencing data, uh, the different rearrangements that take place between chromosomes, which is shown in uh, uh, like a pinkish color, I guess. Um, and then uh, intra-chromosomal rearrangements are shown in green. 
And what you can see here is that there's some tumors that are, are very noisy, right? There's a lot of rearrangements that, that are going on here. Uh, and there's others that are fairly silent, right? There's only maybe a, a few events. So you have a case like this where there's just tons of rearrangements going on. You can imagine that there's going to be lots of fusion genes created here, right? Which are the ones that we care about, right? Which are the ones that are contributing to cancer? Uh, which are the ones, if this is a patient sample, um, are there any fusions that we might be able to treat based on, right? So, um, so that's why we might use other methods. mRNA sequencing is, is one of the most popular methods for doing this. Uh, just get it the transcriptome. Uh, it, it's inexpensive, right? Because it's, uh, you sequence the transcriptome, it's really a small percentage of the genome that you're, you sequence data for. Uh, it's only like two or three percent of the genome is actually corresponding to uh, to mRNAs. Um, the nice thing about this is that if they have a fusion that um, is well expressed and it's contributing to cancer, then hopefully we find it because it's it's uh, it's expressed. Whereas other fusions that are in the genome that are not really contributing, uh, if they're not expressed, we're not going to detect them. So it helps us to put the lamp post next to um, those uh, those fusion events that might be most meaningful. Okay, uh, there's, there's, there's just one study here where they discovered uh, mast and, and notch fusions. Um, one of the earliest applications was back in 2008, 2009, uh, where they basically, along with the development of RNA-seq itself, um, to show that you can actually detect fusion transcripts with, um, with RNA-seq data. And uh, there's been a, you know, how many fusions are there? Um, we've been cataloging these things for a while. Um, there are a lot of them, and uh, there's been an explosive growth in the, the, the size of these catalogs since the, the invention of next generation sequencing, or right, the application of next generation sequencing. Uh, so this is just from a paper from 2015. We have um, guided approaches, so this would be a little more like looking at karyotypes or, or doing um, you know, direct like PCR-based approaches for, for targeting fusions. And you'll see, you know, we've got small, relatively small numbers. Catalogs haven't really been growing all that much. But then once you get to around 2009, you know, when Illumina comes on the scene and, and a lot of these other approaches, uh, we see this massive increase in the number of, of fusions that people are finding. Um, this is 2015, uh, topped out at around 8,000 fusions. Um, the number of fusions that we have now is, is just, it eclipses that in a big way. I mean, you're looking at... Yeah, this is from, from 2018. There's a collection that had 21,000 fusion genes. And you know, it depends on, depends on what resource you're using, because it could easily be 100,000. Um, right now, it's somewhere between you know, 20,000 and probably 50,000. Yeah, question? Yeah, my question is uh, just like, looking into like, the fusion landscape and knowing all the different fusion colors, um, there's, like, in the literature, it says that a lot of them are error -prone. So looking at this number, could this include false positives as well? Or oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We just don't yeah. know for a fact. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So so how many of these actually matter, right? And how many of them, well, how many matter? That's this one, right? Uh, how many of them are real versus being artifacts? That's like an, another question. Um, so these are all things that, that we're, we're dealing with right now. But the key here is that. Yeah, yeah, before we get to that, um, the key is, is that, um, just to follow up real quick, um, the number of fusions that we're finding is still far smaller than the number of fusions that are possible, all right? Because if you have, if you have say, 20,000 genes, all right, and yet 20,000 times 20,000 is, is what? I don't know. What is it, 400? 40 million? 400, I don't know. Um, whatever, it's a big number, right? And uh, 21,000 is a lot smaller than that. Uh, so we still haven't, you know, it's not like we're, we're seeing like every possible fusion under the sun. Um, but anyway, the numbers keep growing and we, we really don't know. Um, true versus false in a lot of cases. Another question, yes? Yeah, earlier you mentioned like you can use RNA-seq for, for most of the fusions, right? I guess I'm wondering like when you were talking about um, earlier you gave an example where there's a fusion that affected the promoter region specifically and you were able to find, you know, later I guess that affected Outside of doing whole genome and RNA-seq, are there ways of doing that in a sense? Or not really? um, right, so what other methods could you use to detect uh, those kinds of fusions between, besides RNA-seq and whole genome sequencing? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the, uh, one of the ways is just having a targeted approach. So if you, know, if you know that one of the partners is involved, then you can see what are the other, what are the other possible partners. 
Um, so there are different approaches for doing that. The, the earlier approach was um, was called RACE, Rapid Amplification of CDNA Ends, uh, which is like a PCR type approach. Um, we can, you know, if, you, if you know one partner and you want to know what are the other possible partners, you can try to figure that out by doing uh, sequencing uh, based on that. Uh, there are other um, uh, panels of genes that are, are commonly used with PCR type approaches for doing uh, fusion diagnostics. Um, these are things that would be used in the clinic. Um, so there's a company called Archer that has a panel to do this, Archer DX, I think it's called. Um, but there's a, there's a few different sort of solutions that are out there, but they're, they're, they're targeted to specific genes in their collection. Uh, sometimes they have specific fusion pairs they're looking for. In other cases, they know like one partner is sort of promiscuous. Um, and you'll find it linked up with a bunch of others. And, and um, so it'll basically just try to figure out what those others are. Right? Um, but really, it's, you know, it's, it's PCR-based techniques um, at that level. Unless you want to do things like the karyotypes and other more visual assays. You know, that's, that's the other way to do it. Any other questions? No? OK. All right, how RNA-seq data is generated? Um, you guys probably saw this, maybe. No, yes. It's part of the workshop. All right, it's a lot of stuff like measuring expression and kind of RNA-seq to do that. Uh, so yeah, so you just start total RNA, do a poly-A capture, fragment, size select, and then you get paradense sequencing. So basically you do single lens sequencing. Um, but you guys are already experts in that. All right. Um, so if we have if we have a fusion gene, all right, and so this is a fusion gene up here, we get gene X with a gene Y, um, and if we we transcribe this, we splice out all the introns, uh, we end up with this fusion transcript, all right. Um, now if we're gonna do RNA seq, we're gonna get we're gonna get reads that are gonna look like these different uh, different flavors call them. Um, and we'll say we'll do paradens sequencing here. Um, so let's just look at this top fragment here. This is one RNA-seq fragment. We're doing paradense sequencing, right? So we get a little, little green read on each end. And uh, when we map this to the fusion transcript or we map it back to the genome, we're going to see that it corresponds to gene X. All right, both these, these reads are going to correspond to gene X. Uh, we'll have this flavor, right, where we have, uh, we have read one and read two. Read one, it maps to the green gene X. Uh, but the orange part maps to gene Y. All right, so this is a this would be called a, a discordant read pair, okay? Because the reads are going to different genes, and not like you would expect them to. But each read aligns entirely to its target. All right, this entire green read here maps entirely to the gene X, and this orange read maps entirely to the gene Y. Um, now we have another flavor. All right, where we have we have uh, we have one read over here. Um, from this fragment, right, the left read or the, the, the read one, um, part of that read maps to the green, right, and part of that read maps to the orange. Okay, so this is, what, this is a split read alignment. Okay, so this is also evidence that there's a, a fusion there. Uh, but if we look at the if we look at the orange, uh, the, the, the right read here, uh, that entire read aligns to gene Y. And the reason why there's a little line here is because it probably aligns between uh, Lines like right here, across the uh, the junction, splicing junction. All right, then we have another category, or, or fourth category here, where we have we have both reads and they both align to um, to gene Y. They're both they're both orange. All right. So basically, there's there's different categories. Right, we have we have a category of, of just being a, a normal read. All right, so it's it's aligning properly, a properly paired end alignment. And um, in this top one here, this would give us a properly paired end alignment, so we wouldn't suspect there's anything wrong, right? Looks good. Uh, in the bottom one, it's, it's going to be just like a normal RNA-seq read alignment. All right, so tell us anything about being a fusion. It just aligns, and there's no flag set. It just aligns as a, a, normal, a normal read. Uh, but these two reads in the middle, th these are really our evidence for fusion transcripts. All right, and they come in two types. They come in the type where we have just discordant read pairs, all right, and we have, which is this one, all right, one read is aligning somewhere, and the other read is aligning in a place where you wouldn't expect it to be. Uh, and then we have the other category, which is the split reads, okay, where one read, one read sequence itself, all right, part of that read sequence is aligning different, to different places, 
that you wouldn't expect. Uh, so we're basically looking for both of these types of reads, the spanning, this we call them spanning fragments, and split reads or junction reads. Okay, so um, with RNA-seq, using RNA-seq to, uh, to find fusions, the goal is really just to take all the RNA-seq data that we get and then infer uh, fusion genes from those split reads and those, um, those discordant reads. So that's the job of all these different tools. And then once we have the fusion transcript, we're basically inferring that if we see a fusion transcript, we're inferring that there's probably a, a fusion event that happens at the chromosome level. Um, not always the case. You have something called transplacing, right, which would give you the same kind of fusion transcript, right, but it does not involve any chromosomal rearrangements. Okay, so splicing machinery can make mistakes and accidentally splice things together and maybe it shouldn't go together. You know, maybe it's, it's neutral and, and there's no impact. Um, uh, in other cases, it might make a, 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 a trans-spliced product, and that's actually playing an important role for the biology. All right, but you cannot, from the transcript level, you cannot differentiate trans-splicing from a gene fusion event. All right, you can only get that if you look at the DNA level. But since trans-splicing is so rare, and given that we're studying cancer, you know, we have, uh, we're coming in with a high probability that if we find a fusion transcript, it's probably due to a chromosomal rearrangement. There's probably some good Bayesian statistics argument having a high prior or something like that, but that's beyond me. All right, so um, with RNA-seq data, there's a couple key ways which we might go about uh, detecting these fusions. And this is the stuff they're gonna be doing in, um, after lunch when we do our, our fusion lab. You're gonna be playing around with these different approaches. We'll start with our RNA-seq reads, and we're gonna line them to the genome. We're gonna see, you know, is there evidence that, that uh, we might have a fusion? We're gonna have, the, again, those two flavors of reads. We're gonna have the, the discordant read pairs. Uh, we're here, we have a spanning fragment where one read is aligned to, to one gene, and the other read is aligned to a different gene. And we have uh, split reads, right, where we have a single read that is now has a split alignment between two genes. And um, these are the two flavors of, um, of evidence that we're looking for to find fusions. The other way to do it is uh, to first uh, do de novo transcriptome assembly. Okay, so we can we can try to reconstruct transcripts in a genome-free way directly from the, the reads. And once we have those reconstructed transcripts, some of them might actually be fusion transcripts that we've reconstructed. All right, so we can detect them as fusion transcripts by aligning those transcripts, not the reads, all right, but aligning the transcripts the genome sequence and seeing, do we have evidence that there's a chimeric transcript? All right, now I'll give us evidence for uh, maybe it's a fusion. It could also be an assembly artifact, all right, because these assemblers, you know, I know a little bit about it, because um, I'm, I'm part of a group that, that built one of the one of the popular ones, um, and uh, they do generate lots of artifacts, too, all right, so being able to tell the difference between, you know, is it an artifact or is it a real fusion, uh, there's some, uh, some challenges there, uh, but that can give us good evidence for a fusion. Okay, um, this is just uh, uh, driving the same, the same point home. Um, when you do the alignments, you know, you're basically starting with these reads, um, and uh, yeah, depending upon uh, where the read was derived from in the fusion transcript, you could have split read uh, going to the genome, uh, or you can, align, you can align to the transcripts themselves, right? So these are the spliced transcripts as the targets instead of the genome as the target. Um, and in this case, you find that the same thing, right? You find part of the read is lying to one gene, part of the read is lying to a different gene. Uh, basically, just there's, there's two, I mean, the key point here is that there's two ways to do this, I guess. One is that you can align the reads to the genome, all right? You have to take into account introns and the genes. Uh, the other way is to align to the transcriptome, all right? You don't have to worry about introns, right? Just align directly to the transcripts. Um, but regardless of the approach you're taking, you're still looking for, for evidence from the reads to support your, your underlying fusions. Uh, the paradens, um, in the case you don't have a split read, or if you don't have a split read, then uh, you have a general idea these two genes might go together. We don't know where the breakpoint is. You really need that, that split read or that junction read in order to define uh, where the breakpoint is in the, uh, in the transcript. Um, the other point here is that if you have a split read, you know which exons go together at the transcript level. Okay, but at the DNA level, at the genome level, you don't necessarily know where that breakpoint is. 
all right? Because these genes, you know, the, the human genome is huge, all right? And some of the introns, you know, can be you know, 10, 20, 30 kb long, you know? And some that are almost 100 kb or even longer than 100 kb. Um, and, you know, you don't know exactly where that, that breakpoint is in the genome. You're not going to have that level of precision. You'll have a general idea, but you won't know. So even though you can detect this, the breakpoint at the transcript, um, you don't necessarily know where that breakpoint is exactly in the genome. And sometimes you'll have alternatively spliced isoforms that are fusion transcripts. Okay, so, um, you know, I'll give you different breakpoints at the transcript level. Uh, but again, at the genome level, you're not going to know for sure. You'll have some hints. Um, okay, this is, uh, if you have, if you, if you map to the transcriptome, you're going to get different alignment, alignment uh, different percent of your reads that align than if you align to the genome. Uh, the choice of the, of the uh, annotation they use, like if you use UCSC annotations or you use RefSeq annotations, um, whatever choice you use for your, your reference is going to make a difference as well in terms of how many reads you're going to map. Um, what's your, what your sensitivity is going to be for pulling up these, uh, these fusion transcripts. Um, in general, we, we tend to use an approach uh, where we use the genome and the transcriptome. Instead of, just, instead of just using the genome only or using the transcriptome only, uh, we can use tools that are basically targeting the genome, but they're transcriptome aware. All right? so, so you give it the genome, but you're also giving it uh, your reference annotation. All right? Hopefully, like GenCode. GenCode is what I use. Uh, that's what I recommend as, as sort of your, your source for reference annotations. Uh, it's a very good quality product. Um, give it the genome, give it your reference GTF file, use a tool that align the reads to the genome in a, in a transcript aware way. All right? It's taking into account the known splice junctions. Um, that's going to be your, your best approach going forward. Yeah, lots of tools that have been, yeah, go ahead. So that approach will only work as long as there's no, when the fusion happens, there's no range. Uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, for it, doesn't, it doesn't take into account anything to do with the coding level yet. Okay. Um, it's because some, again, some, some of your, um, some of your fusions are going to give you fusion proteins. Um, others are going to give you just basically knockouts and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So some of the first tools came out around 2008, 2009. Uh, these are the ones that that are um, currently available. There, there's probably, I'm sure there's a lot more. These are the ones that I've, I've come across. Um, but occasionally you'll find a new one that, that was published in some obscure journal, and I can't even get the paper because the PDF is behind a paywall. Um, so it's just, just, there's just many, many tools that are available to do this. Um, yeah, every, every so often, uh, just do a, do a PubMed search, and you'll find a, a bunch of new ones. And my general experience with this, I've been, I've been working in this area for a few years now. Um, my, my general experience, especially when I first got started with this a few years ago, you pick a few different programs, and yeah, they have different uh, different challenges in terms of their setup. Uh, when you run them, there's different challenges, um, and when you get the results, you know, you picture the results of three programs being this Venn diagram, right? You got you got one one tool that's going to predict a whole bunch of fusions, right? You got another one that's like a moderate number, another one's a small number. And if you compare the, the predictions that they're agreeing upon, it's, it's generally a you know, small fraction of all the fusions. You know, so which one do you trust? Um, do you just take the intersection of two or more? Um, you know, how do you do this? Um, do you have to run three tools? Do you have to run four tools? you got like 30 or 40 tools to choose from now, right? There's a lot of tools that are out there. So, uh, so how do you do this? And then you know, when, you're, when you're running these things, there's, there's other sort of logistical challenges. You know, one might take, you know, weeks to run, right? You pray to God it doesn't crash along that time, or does it get kicked out of your grid submission system or whatever you're using, right? Power doesn't go out. <laughs> um, another one, you know, you can't run your laptop. You need to run it on a sophisticated compute farm uh, using a specialized uh, grid submission system. Uh, so it's really, it's not set up for anyone to just kind of come along and just sort of set it up and give it a whirl. You have to have you know, you have to have that that environment that the people that develop the software are, are, are tuned into. So it really kind of limits the, the accessibility. Um, or maybe you can get it to run, but it, just, it takes you a long time and an amount of effort to, to get it going on your system. Um, and there's others where dinosaurs jump out and try to eat you up while you're trying to 
get it set up. So there's just lots of things you have to take into consideration here. Um, when all else fails, all right, so I love this paper. Actually, I just, I think they're recording us, so I'm going to stop saying certain things. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, what I, what I like about this, so they, they ran they ran a few different program, uh, programs to find a fusion, and they had they had the specific fusion they were looking for. They had some some evidence going into it um, that uh, this fusion exists, right? Uh, but when they ran these different programs, they didn't find any of the programs calling that fusion. Uh, so they basically turned to using grep. And I heard you guys talking about grep earlier, right? It's just like a search utility in Linux. You just give it a text string, say like grep, and it'll just find it, all right? So basically, they took they took the fusion sequence they would expect to find if, if this fusion exists. They basically just grepped that sequence, like a 30 or 40 base pair sequence, base sequence, uh, from, from the raw reads, right? Just take a fast Q file, just run grep on it, right? Um, this is like, you know, the last approach, like, you tried everything else, it's like, you know, I'm just going to go and just, just do perfect string matching on this thing and see if I can find it. And lo and behold, they, they find evidence for it. They found some reads that actually support this fusion, right? Um, so there is evidence in there, but the, the tools didn't find it for whatever reason. Um, so it's unfortunate. Um, I do, I want to, I'm trying to get a hold of this data set because I'm curious to see how some of our tools will, will behave with it. And it turns out this is just not like a regular... Uh, typical fusion. This isn't like BCR able or Tempers 2 erg or one of the you know common fusions that we're we're familiar with that are pretty clean and pretty easy to to find. Uh, there's some complexities with with this guy. Um, but I'm very I'm more I'm very curious about it. Um, but I, I love this paper. I just I just love this paper. Um, anyway, um, yeah. All right. So there's the sources of false positives. Uh, you, have, you have different kinds of artifacts. Um, there's alignment artifacts, you have uh, chimeric read artifacts just, just from um, your library prep, um, where you get ligation artifacts, or reverse transcriptase, template switching, um, and there's biological artifacts. You know, we're searching the regular, regular, we're searching the, the, the um, standard reference genome. Um, and now, you know, there, there's alignment tools that are, some of the newer alignment tools will take into account natural variation, right, natural human variation that, that exists. Um, so you're actually searching like a graph genome instead of just a linear set of characters, right? Because uh, we know there's lots of there's structural variation, there's there's polymorphisms, there's a lot of you know the differences between different individuals, and, and some of these tools can actually capitalize on that, so you actually get better alignments. Uh, but if you don't take that into account, then you'll you'll get false evidence, right? Sometimes you'll get mismappings that's that's indicative of a fusion event, um, but it's not really a fusion event. If you actually included the fact that hey, there's there's polymorphisms at this place for different populations or structural variations that we know about. Um, then you would have got the correct alignment, and it would not have been a false false mapping suggesting a fusion. Um, and you have things like you know transplacing that that occurs. Um, so there's a lot of peculiarities there. There are things you can do. I, mean, I know we only have a few minutes left before I go to lunch, so I'm going to try to to um, to run through uh, just the most important parts here uh, towards the end. Um, so there's just various filters that um, some of the newer tools will apply. Um, to screen things against uh, databases of, of known artifacts or, th or fusions that would routinely turn up in normal data sets. Um, consider the strength of the evidence. You know, if, you, if you have 100 million reads and you only find there's like one or two reads that are supporting a fusion event, is that really relevant? Or is this, I mean, it could be just that you know, if you, if you, the, the deeper you sequence, the more artifacts you're going to see. Eventually you're going to have some of these artifacts agreeing with each other. Uh, so you really should take into account, it's kind of like expression, right? Um, if you have gene that's that's, that's lowly expressed, yeah, you know, you're gonna you're gonna pick up evidence for it as you sequence deeper. But eventually, you, you sequence so deep, it looks like the entire human genome is expressed, all right? And we know that that's that's not the case. That caused a lot of controversy a few years ago. Meaningful expression, even if every base in the human genome is transcribed, you know, there's meaningful expression and there's just you know, basal transcription that probably makes no difference in addition to artifacts, so um, taking that into account is important. Uh, some other things, we have a tool called Fusion Inspector that will uh, do a supervised view. So if you, if you give it a pair of fusions and say, okay, find me the evidence for the BCR able fusion, um, it will do that. It will it'll create these mini fusion contigs, align to the mini fusion contigs, and allow us to visualize it. So we can, just, we can put it up in IGV, we can see the fusion genes, we can see the evidence that corresponds to the fusion partners. Uh, we do de novo transcriptome assembly to reconstruct those fusions. 
Uh, but I really like this because because this you know if, it's one thing to look at a report and see okay I've got two reads that support this at a different junction reads. Um, I want to see the evidence, right? Show it to me. Show me the reads. Show me the reads and where they align and how good the alignments are. And that's exactly what this does. And this is something we're going to play with in the afternoon. Um, there's other visualization tools you can use. Um, we can prioritize fusion candidates in a number of ways. Um, if, you, if you're screening you know, hundreds of patient samples, if you find that there's, a, and they're all a certain type of cancer, you know, if you find there's a certain fusion that keeps showing up multiple times in this cancer, then you might consider that to be a, a good indicator that it's, it's playing a role in that cancer. If you only see it once, um, you know, depending upon what the genes are, uh, the expression, um, uh, you, know, you, you might you might consider it be a, a potential um, or not. You have balance rearrangements, um, so you have other, so if you find you know, a fusion event, you might find the reciprocal fusion events, that sort of gives you more evidence to support that a, a translocation happened. Um, strength of the evidence, the types of genes that are involved, right, because you find kinases, if you find a kinase fusion in your patient sample, you might want to consider that, right, because then you have uh, kinase inhibitors, right, they're, they're treatable in some cases. Um, other genes that show up, um, there are transcription factors that are sort of like the uh, the usual suspects, take them into consideration. Uh, there's papers that have been published in the last few years that are doing uh, like pan-can studies across all cancers, like in TCGA. Um, so there's there's lots of good resources that are being developed, um, and also more insights into what kinds of tumors, you have, what kind of tumors, what kind of fusions are you finding in different cancers? So what fusions are relevant to specific cancers? What fusions are basically um, maybe relevant to cancer, but but you find them in a bunch of different cancers, so they're not really cancer specific in that way. Um, correlations of fusions with genome, measures of genome instability. Um, so these are all the kinds of things that people are looking into right now. Building large collections of fusions. So we have big databases now, like ChimerSeq. Uh, this is the one that has like uh, 30,000 gene pairs. But again, uh, most of those are just uh, predicted, so they're not. They're not, um, they don't have like experimental evidence, They're just predicted from different programs. Uh, you might find some promiscuous partners, right? So some genes that like to fuse with other genes. Uh, depending upon what study you're looking at, you'll find some cancers, you find that there's, um, you know, certain, certain gene partners that show up time and time again. Even if it's not the same pair that are always fused, one of the genes is found fused often with other partners. All right, so we can take that into account. Um, Fusion databases, so TCGA, Cosmic. There's this nice uh, collections of, of fusions that are are, um, are are known to be relevant to cancer biology. We've got a tool that you'll play with later called Fusion Annotator. If they give it the fusion gene pair, it'll tell you, hey, we've seen this in Cosmic, or we've seen this in TCGA, or we've seen this in these other databases. Uh, so it's basically my way of trying to, um, to easily annotate fusions according to what's been previously reported. Um, and really be able to flag fusions that, that could be relevant, particularly in um, studying patient samples. Uh, if you have expression information, you can you know, look at the expression information and see if that supports the fusion. Open up IGV, look at the expression profile. If you have a prediction for, for a fusion that looks like this, and you see that you know at our predicted breakpoint, we basically have a loss of expression, right? that's, a, that's a good sign that there's something peculiar going on here, um, and maybe it is a, a fusion gene that, that's, um, that's well supported by the RNA-seq data. Um, so that's a good thing to do. All right, um, reading frame. So we have a tool called um, called uh, well, it's just it's an option actually. Examine coding effect. So if you're curious, you know, if you have this fusion event, does it does it make a fusion protein? Yeah, you know, that's something we might be interested in. Um, we have some reports that will basically indicate that. Yeah, this this looks like it's a fusion protein. Um, we have databases of of fusions that are probably not. Relevant to cancer, all right. These are just fusions that are showing up in um, in normal data sets like GTEx. GTEx is a, is a great collection of uh, transcriptomes from normal samples. Um, if we see that in a cancer sample, maybe we're going to discard it because uh, it's really not not critical. All right, let me just see what else we have here. People are getting hungry. All right, so this is what we're going to do. Um, after lunch, uh, we're going to take RNA-seq data, we're going to use star fusion to find fusion predictions, we're going to use fusion inspector um, to visualize the evidence for those predicted fusions. 
Uh, and then we use Fusion Annotator to see if they, any of them have shown up before in um, different databases or known to be relevant to cancer biology. And we can use, um, and we'll look at the fusion coding effect too and see if it looks like it's uh, making a fusion protein or not.